Um, good afternoon. Well, here I am at home in the Adelaide Hills. Um, and I just thought I'd uh, try out a set of lecture slides with you. The title of the set of lecture slides is, as you can see, Modern Monetary Theory, the Economy and the Virus. And you can see uh, I've started with a picture somebody shared with me on Facebook, um, which illustrates nicely the complacency that uh, our politicians and people generally have had until very recently. Um, about to be swamped by this uh, terrible virus, which, has, as you know, has uh, infected well over a quarter of a million people around the world already, and there have been well over 10,000 deaths. And uh, it, it, it's likely, of course, to get far, far worse than this, with um, potentially hundreds of millions of people infected with the virus and millions. Of people dying prematurely from it. And meanwhile, in the background, we've got the massive, long lasting, uh, and to an extent, inevitable consequences of this in the form of uh, that huge recessionary wave. And it's how to manage the economic consequences of the virus and that um, there's been a lot of discussion about, obviously, recently, uh, online and in the media, um, that that's what I'd like to talk about now. The last time Australia had what people regard as a technical recession, which is two successive quarters of negative growth in real GDP was the early 1990s, and at that time, the Treasurer of Australia, subsequently the Prime Minister, was Paul Keating, and he wrongly called that a recession that Australia had to have. And that was a demand side recession, and Australia and other countries did not have to have a recession at that point in time, because a demand side recession is actually um, relatively easy to avoid, given the right policy settings, or at least to mitigate. This really is, of course, a recession that we have to have, because um, parts, when I say parts, um, very large parts of our economies are going to remain closed or at least uh, are going to have to be far smaller and limited in their extent than they have been in, in normal times and they will be in the future until this terrible epidemic is, is in the past. So you see pictures around the world of uh, uh, people in uh, what were busy uh, towns and cities which at the moment are empty because people are on lockdown in so many places in Italy and Spain where my sister lives and, and California and this is going to spread to so many other places in time it's bound to. This crisis is going to take a very long time to be um, substantially passed. It will either depend on us uh, eventually many of us catching it and uh, surviving it <coughs> as i may have done in the last few weeks i've not been tested but the last couple of weeks i've not been very well um uh, or uh, a vaccine being developed it's difficult to see how places like uh, china where uh, the, the countries that have been more successful in managing the virus and putting downward pressure on the number of new infections are places like China, which are more authoritarian, or uh, Korea, where uh, the government has much greater institutional capacity for planning ahead than we have in many Western um, democracies. Uh, or Japan, uh, where socially people are, are perhaps more likely to do what they're advised to do by the government than is the case in the US or in European countries or in Australia. Uh, for that matter, but it's going to take many months for us to get past this. And uh, I've been troubled about all the talk about economic stimulus. People keep talking about the Australian government stimulus package or um, President Trump introducing a stimulus package or Boris Johnson introducing a stimulus or worse still when they talk about central bank stimuluses <coughs> because there is really nothing that central banks can do. Um, to 
well, there's not just a limited amount they can do to support the economy. There's nothing they can do to stimulate uh, economic activity at the moment. But what's happening around the world is uh, governments are slowly getting around to understanding just how severe and historic this crisis is and how dramatically they need to act in order just to stop economic activity deflating with catastrophic consequences for people's standard of living and, and social stability generally. But what they're doing is not stimulating the economy. It's about providing support for uh, people so that people can still stay living where they are at the moment, not be driven into poverty, be able to obtain basic necessities. And of course, that means supporting the economy generally. Once we get past this crisis, we need to rethink a lot of things because the um, prevailing dominant economic narrative of the last generation or two, the last 40 years really, has led us to build increasingly fragile economies and an increasingly fragile and uh, connected global economy um, over those decades. And this crisis has revealed these fragilities. There will be other types of crises in the future and we, want, we really ought to be thinking about how we go about building a less fragile economic system in the future. Richard Murphy wrote a great blog piece the other day um, explaining that this crisis has very little, if anything, in common with what happened in 2008 or going back further, you could talk about any recession over time, including the early 90s recession, but the Great Depression of 1929 too. Um, the 1929 depression, the Great Recession of 2008, were demand side crises triggered by um, a financial crisis, which was the result of an unsustainable build up of private debt. And those financial crises, to different extents, because uh, the 2008 crisis was much better managed than the 1929 one led to a collapse in demand. And of course that had an impact on production and the demands and, and, and the supply side of the economy uh, in 1929, a particularly long lasting one. And multiplier effects and uh, um, people have uh, since 2008 talked about a balance sheet recession. The financial impact of the 2008 um, Great Recession um, meant that instead of there being a rapid economic recovery, which has been the normal outcome of more limited recessions down through the decades, um, the economic, the, the recession of 2008 was, was uh, much more prolonged, the recovery uh, much more limited and uh, taken much longer to do. And in, of course, some countries, uh, particularly the European southern European countries there really hasn't been a, 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 an economic recovery from 2008 even 12 years later. Um, this crisis however is a very different one isn't it? It's, it's not, um, we do have more fragility because of the high level of private debt which in some places has been built up again in, in the case of Australia it didn't deflate in 2008 so we have virtually a world record level of household debt in Australia. Yes, that makes our economic system uh, more vulnerable when a crisis strikes. But of course, this crisis, as everybody knows, has uh, a medical origin. The virus, the epidemic, has triggered the crisis. And the initial impact of, of that on the global economy was the supply side impact because the virus was initially um, concentrated, of course, in China. And that impact wasn't obvious immediately either because of uh, uh, complications to do with the Ch Chinese New Year. But then, of course, uh, the virus has spread and the impact has spread and we've had an enormous impact on demand too. So this is both a demand side and a supply side crisis. It's not just about um, uh, engendering a recovery in aggregate demand and allowing 
a, a recovery in the economy, which was the case, for example, in 2008. It's more complicated than that, even though, of course, the final impact has a lot of similarities because uh, we are talking about the potential for uh, many businesses and whole sectors of the economy to collapse, at least if the right economic policies are not in, put, put in place in the countries uh, uh, that are concerned. And we're talking about uh, mass unemployment and the potential for uh, massive uh, amounts of uh, poverty and uh, defaults and um, all the consequences from that. So what we need to do is, is not stimulate economic recovery because in fact large parts of our economies have to remain um, much smaller or closed down for the moment. We have to support the economy and that means supporting people and of course the first priority is public health and that should be all government's first priority at the moment and that's not just about taking measures to limit the rate of spread of the virus in order to um, in order to reduce the, the peak scale of new infections it is of course about ramping up also the capacity of healthcare systems in countries around the world to deal with this crisis uh, it, there's no doubt that countries with uh, effectively medicare for all systems a better place to deal with the crisis. I saw in the debate between Joseph Biden and uh, Bernie Sanders recently, Joseph Biden saying, well, Italy's in no better position to deal with this crisis than us, and they've got Medicare for all. He was entirely wrong, of course, had Italy not got the right for everybody to have access to, to um, basic health care, regardless of their ability to pay for it. The crisis would have been even worse there, although undoubtedly the fact that Italy's uh, public services, including healthcare, have been dramatically underfunded for years because of the nonsense, which is the Eurozone and uh, the um, fiscal restraints which have been imposed on countries like Italy within uh, the Eurozone. Uh, the second priority for governments which i take it that our government in australia has put a, an enormous amount of effort into doing and they are continuing to do it on an ongoing basis is to ensure that the supply chains for the basic essentials that we need to consume over time are not compromised uh, if they are compromised if this crisis goes on for a long time and basic necessities for which there are no decent alternatives come into short supply, then you can't allow, as some very foolish people on the internet have suggested would be a good idea, uh, the price system to ration these basic essentials, uh, depriving people on low incomes from being able to obtain them at all. You'd have to, under those circumstances, introduce some form of price controls and, and you uh, would more than likely have to move to a rationing system, as in wartime. Of course, people, individuals need support. And uh, Boris Johnson in the UK has moved a huge distance in this direction in, in the last uh, couple of days, talking about uh, guaranteeing 80% um, of the pay, uh, at least uh, up to roughly the median income anyway of people in the uk who would otherwise be losing their income from employment at the moment because of the crisis well there are various ways that you can support individuals i would uh, introduce an effective job guarantee uh, at the moment um, while there were not safe job guarantee activities for people to participate in i would pay people at the job guarantee rate which would be a generous minimum income um, uh, I would do other things as well. Um, so this doesn't just cover people who've lost their um, uh, lost their employment in in permanent full time positions. It covers absolutely everybody. I would be increasing uh, uh, the amount that people who are on New Start at the moment would get to this uh, minimum wage. I would be 
<coughs> obviously covering people in the gig economy and people uh, working as uh, casuals or, or part-time. Um, uh, and on top of that, I'd be uh, doing something that the banks have moved towards doing anyway, which is suspending debt repayments. And I'd go further, I would also suspend rent payments as well. If landlords are not having to pay uh, uh, the interest on mortgages they've taken out, then they don't need to be receiving rents at the moment either. Uh, and other things too, as far as any basic necessities are concerned, there should be no question of anybody losing access to anything at the moment because of, uh, of limited incomes. Governments are moving to support small businesses. I think that this should be done in the form of uh, um, tax refunds or, or grants, as, as is happening, of course, in some places, not in the form of loans. And where large corporations are concerned, uh, uh, equity stakes should be taken. And some of them, including airlines, for example, are probably going to be and probably should be uh, nationalised. Um, there are all sorts of other things that uh, you need to do. There's a lot of ways to um, crack an egg. So we don't need to be overly prescriptive about the approach um, to support individuals, small businesses and large corporations. You need to support business organisations. Otherwise, when we get past this and the economy is recovering, there won't be a supply side of the economy to have recovery in. We need to keep institutions afloat. Um, but the emphasis must be on ensuring that you meet the basic needs for safety and security of all individuals and it's important not to leave anybody out. In the long term, well, you know, there'll be, as I said, other crises around the corner and the next one might be climate change related. It could be another virus. We really need to think about a whole variety of issues to do with how we manage our economy. How did it become so financialized? How did we diminish the institutional capacity of our governmental organizations so much as we have uh, in many countries? Where did this um, ideological um, obsession, which has made some governments so slow to act and so complacent, faced with those twin waves of the virus and the impending economic depression, as has been the case. Um, and at the same time, of course, we can take moves towards uh, 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 being more proactive where that threat of climate change is concerned. We don't have to restore our economy and economic management in exactly the form that we had it previously. There's no doubt that we have built a very fragile global economic system. This doesn't mean that we need to eliminate international trade or reduce international trade hugely. It does mean that we need to look at uh, um, these complex, long supply chains which have been built around the world. And it means we also need to look at things like how have we allowed ourselves to become so dependent on exports or basic necessities from one or two places. We need a more distributed system. There's no doubt uh, in my mind that's the case. One of the things that modern monetary theory economists have sometimes said in the past is that exports are a, a cost and imports are a a benefit and that uh, in maybe in a slightly different context um, that's something which is 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 clear in in this um, in this crisis uh, it's not that we are dependent on China to buy our exports it's that we are dependent on places like China for the things they choose to export to us. That's something which is clear in a crisis like this one. One of the many things which is clear in a crisis like this one, which perhaps previously was not clear to people. 
Flexibility. When they talk about flexibility in the labour market, well, you know what they mean. They mean casual employment. Um, they mean uh, people who are underemployed. They mean the gig economy. Well, of course, that kind of uh, employer, employee, or when you're not even the employee, that kind of working relationship makes the whole economic system more fragile. It transfers risks from institutions which are more able to bear those risks to individuals who are less able to do so. How we have changed our tax system without doing anything else to enhance the ability of our economy to naturally, to automatically respond to um, a, an economic crisis like this one, or even like one, like a more standard uh, one, which might be less severe, has made us more vulnerable again. And that's where something like a job guarantee that I was talking about just now um, would make us less fragile. It would build automatic stabilizers into the system. Imagine if we would, if we had uh, a guaranteed income that you could claim by moving into a job guarantee scheme um, without politicians having to anticipate anything or plan for anything in advance because there was a scalable job guarantee out there and a legal right uh, 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 to participate in, in the scheme when a downturn like this happened. And I know you'll say, well, maybe they, it might not be safe at the moment to work on the sort of environmental projects which might be important within such a job guarantee. Well, under those circumstances, you just pay people the job guarantee wage to stay at home until you need them. Um, our public sectors in many countries, including Australia, have been starved of resources. Um, at the moment, just today, it's in the news that uh, the CPSU, the Public Sector Trade Union in Australia, is pointing out that the government doesn't have the capacity to deal with a huge increase in people claiming um, job seekers allowance uh, should they become, as many of them are already, becoming unemployment as a, un, un, unemployed as a result of the crisis. But that's only one of the many ways in which we lack uh, 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 the planning expertise and the institutional structures generally within our government organisations these days because of 30, 40 years of neoliberalism. Adding to this, we've got neoclassical macroeconomics dominating policy institutions still, despite the fact that it's been obvious for years that neoclassical macroeconomics um, completely misrepresents and misleads people where the monetary system is concerned and that many highly credentialed economists have nothing useful to say about this crisis really because they don't understand the monetary system some of the things that yeah i'm going to say that people like uh, warwick mckibben who's a very famous economist in australia have said about uh, this particular crisis for example saying that uh, uh, because the government is, uh, um, is smaller than it otherwise would have been as a result of uh, people listening to him. Uh, that meant the government was more in a position financially to deal with this crisis. That, of course, is nonsense. The US government has more, much more national debt than ours. The uh, UK government does also. The Japanese government, six times as much debt as us. They're all perfectly well placed as monetary sovereign governments to respond to the challenges they're faced with. Now that's somebody obviously highly intelligent in their way, good at maths and all that, able to understand the internal logic of quite complicated models, unfortunately based on um, very misleading axioms, fundamental assumptions, which means that the results of those models are uh, um, often useless and sometimes worse than useless and dangerous, as is the case at the moment. And um, it's, it's because they don't understand the monetary system. Uh, one of the things that we need to do is we need to throw out the old macroeconomics textbooks. And I, I mean it. Uh, this crisis is, uh, uh, I've always thought it was uh, unfortunate 
the macroeconomics as it is taught in universities um, dominated by the neoclassical perspective is misleading and that uh, uh, there are a variety of reasons why uh, that's had a very adverse impact on the standard of living of millions of people down the years but um, it's 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 even worse than that now we really need to uh, throw the old new Keynesian monetarist macroeconomic e framework in the bin and teach it only as uh, the history of economic thought the way that um, old and misleading medical theories might get taught to people who are trained as doctors really um, we need a realistic and a useful map of the economy to guide us and that means getting the monetary system right because we need to be able to deal with other crises okay if we want to learn about the monetary system and the macro economy and how it all works then one good way of doing that would be for you to pick up a book written by a very good friend of mine that is going to be published very soon in June I wish they'd rush it out sooner than that because lots of people really need to read it uh, including Warwick McKibben called the deficit myth monetary theory and the birth of the people's economy there are lots of other books there's been a, a, a good macroeconomics textbook excellent macroeconomics textbook by William Mitchell and Randall Ray and Martin Watts that was published uh, last year that's uh, very popular and there are a whole series of other books that I could mention including one I wrote called economics for sustainable prosperity and um, but uh, if I had to recommend people to read one of these books it would be Stephanie's one um, once you read that book, you'll realise if you're an Australian, that Australia is a monetary sovereign, as is the US, as is Japan, as is the UK, for example. In these countries, the federal or central government issues the domestic currency. So the Australian dollar is issued by the Australian Commonwealth government with the assistance of its reserve bank. Every dollar that the government spends is a new dollar. Some of those dollars it then collects back later. It collects, it collects taxes in the currency it issues. Everybody in Australia has to obtain Australian dollars if they are a taxpayer, because the only way that you can pay your taxes is to pay them in Australian dollars. They're, your tax liability is calculated in Australian dollars. That's the unit of account. And your taxes have to be paid in Australian dollars as well. So. Our government issues the dollar, it collects taxes in the dollar. Uh, the currency is not linked to gold or any foreign currency on a fixed exchange rate. What that means is the government is not guaranteed to convert Australian dollars at a fixed rate into anything else which it could possibly run out of. And what's more, our government isn't going to become insolvent as a result of foreign currency denominated debt either because our government has no significant foreign currency denominated debt when it issues treasury bonds and treasury notes long-term and short-term government debt although it's not debt in the conventional sense of the term as we might see in a few minutes um, it only does so in the currency that it issues it obviously can't run out of the currency that it issues so there's no there's no default risk associated with government liabilities in australia federal government liabilities anyway what that means is that our government, like the US government, faces no purely financial constraints. Well, that's obvious now. I mean, look at Boris Johnson in the UK, uh, a, a country with, on the face of it, a high level of uh, government debt <coughs> that in no way limits the ability of the government to spend. So, of course, the um, Conservative government in the UK is able to cover 80% uh, of people's salaries at, at work. The only uh, risk that ever could come with that is the risk of inflation. There's no risk that the government's going to run out of pounds because the government has a limitless ability to spend pounds. It's the currency issuer. It can't run out of its own currency. On the other hand, and this is particularly important in this crisis, all economies face supply side constraints and those supply side constraints are particularly tight at the moment. And that's why this has to be very carefully controlled and managed because as we just said whole sections of the supply side of the economy have basically shut down 
Um, and it may be that there might be a growing problem in the future if this isn't managed properly with the supply of basic necessities which households can still afford to buy because of the financial support being provided by the monetary sovereign government. That's where um, issues like supply chains and capacity and planning and potentially in the future, as I said, potentially price controls and even rationing might come in. But meantime, it is essential that everybody, even the lowest income individual and household, is able to be able to purchase those things. They need to meet their basic needs. And that means that at the moment, the non-government part of the economy needs to be running budget surpluses. In other words, we need to be receiving more from the government than we're having to pay the government in order to support our ability to support ourselves and the economy. And that means governments are going to have to run large budget deficits to allow for the essentially large um, budget surpluses in the private sector. People who go around talking about the government as a household uh, often, you know, on the internet and various social media places and on their blog sites where they often use capital letters to emphasise how angry they are about what's happening at the moment. People who say the government's going to run out of money or the government, just by running a deficit, is going to create hyperinflation, the break breakdown of society. People who confuse governments, which are currency issuers, with households who are currency users, of course, you know, if you're a currency user, you need to get the money before you spend it. And if you spend more than you earn at the moment and you start borrowing and building up debts, you can get into trouble in the future and you could end up insolvent. That should be obvious to everybody by now. As modern monetary theory economists have been saying for years, does not apply to monetary sovereign governments. And in fact, when everybody else is in trouble, that's the time the government has to engage in fiscal injections into the economy, make net deposits into the banking system, into people's bank accounts, which means that the government will be running what we usually call a fiscal deficit. Their expenditure will be far in excess of the amount of taxes that they're taking back out of the system at the moment. That's what needs to happen. Because every dollar spent by the federal government is a new dollar. Government spending creates dollars, and at the moment we need them to create a lot of them. Taxes just destroy dollars. Taxes are one way of, um, as I've already said, creating a demand for the dollar in the first place, but also they are a way of limiting the ability of the private sector to spend so that total spending doesn't go beyond the productive capacity of the economy. Well, at the moment, the private sector isn't going to be spending very much anyway, but what we need to, to, to make sure is that people who've lost their jobs or people on low incomes have sufficient income that they can spend enough to maintain their basic needs. That means more dollars being spent into the system than being taxed out of the system at the moment. I don't want to even talk about why governments borrow, but they don't need to. When the government spends more than it taxes, all this does is it puts additional dollars into the banking system and into the reserves that the banks hold at the central bank, at the Fed in the US, at the Bank of England in the UK, at the Reserve Bank of Australia, in Australia. Now, uh, it has come to be conventional down the years, although it's not applied in the same way in every country, but it's come to be conventional for the government to issue things called treasury bonds, government debt securities, to approximately offset the difference between government spending and taxation over time, and to drain the banking system of those excess reserves. This has had something to do with interest rate management. There are other ways of managing interest rates. Uh, it's not 
an argument I want to get into at the moment because it becomes very complicated very quickly, as I've sometimes discovered discussing this with, uh, with people in, in public forum. So let's just say the government is the currency issuer. It could just spend dollars into the banking system and leave them there. There is no need to issue government bonds. If you're worried about the issuance of additional interest bearing government debt, well, just don't issue it there. The macroeconomic function of taxation is to create a demand for the dollar and to limit inflationary pressures. Remember, taxes don't fund government spending, not in the literal sense that is getting the cart before the horse. Governments spend dollars into circulation. Those dollars are then available to be paid in taxes. If the government spends more than it taxes, that just means that the government is making a net deposit of dollars in the banking system. It means nothing more than that. The so-called national debt, which is better described as the government's debt because it's not the debt of the nation at all, but isn't really a debt in a conventional sense, and I would rather talk about as the net money supply, is just dollars that the government over time has spent into the system, which is not yet taxed out of the system. That's and surpluses and deficits cancel out across the system, as I think I've already made clear, if you weren't aware of this before. Another way of saying this is that um, on our monetary system for every lender, there's a, a borrower. If you, uh, if you uh, earn more than you spend, then you at the moment are able to add to your savings. You're running personally a, a budget surplus. You're gonna be a lender on the monetary system. If you spend more than you earn and you need to borrow uh, the difference, then you'll be running a deficit. You'll be borrowing on the monetary system. Um, these obviously have to cancel out. Consequently, across the entire monetary system, well, the whole thing has to be in balance the whole time. Because if there is a government deficit, there'll be a non-government surplus. We often divide the system up into three between the government, the domestic private sector, and the foreign sector or the rest of the world. And between the three sectors, they have to balance out. So for example, if at the moment the country has approximately balanced trade and the private sector at the moment is desperately in need of additional funding, running a surplus, then the government has to run a deficit in order to support the economy. If they don't do this, then we'll have a terrible, absolutely appalling Great Depression. And people at the moment, there are one or two um, idiots out there on the internet talking about governments, even now, having to balance their budgets or uh, um, yeah, minimise fiscal deficits. This is not the time to talk. Well, actually, it's never the time to talk about that kind of thing. It is normal and natural for governments to run deficits most of the time. In countries that don't have big trade surpluses, if the private sector is going to run surpluses most of the time, which is what should be the case if there's going to be healthy private sector balance sheets and a strong anti-fragile financial system, then the government should be running a deficit and the deficit should be whatever level is necessary for there to be non-inflationary full employment. At the moment, the government needs to run, governments need to run big deficits almost everywhere. If you do run a surplus, it's just the government taking more dollars out of the system than it's putting in the system. A budget surplus is just a drain for dollars or a vacuum cleaner for dollars or a dustbin for dollars. Because when you pay taxes, the dollars that you use to pay your taxes, those electronic dollars are just destroyed. They don't fund government spending. Government spending creates dollars, taxes destroy them. A budget surplus today does nothing to put the government in a better position to be able to spend when it needs to in the future next time there's a surplus, nothing at all. The government cannot save its own currency, it issues the currency. Just as the government can't really borrow, meaningfully borrow its own currency when they swap a government bond for a, 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 a balance that a bank has at the central bank, um, then actually they're swapping one 
government liability for another. People think our monetary system is like what you can see on the left. Here are some diagrams from a, a book by uh, an MMT economist, a former architect called J.D. Out. People think that the federal government is borrowing from foreign countries and borrowing from the private sector and at the same time taxing the lifeblood out of the private sector that has very little money in the first place and wasting all this money that it's borrowing on entitlements uh, um, and finding other imaginative ways to waste it on discretionary spending. And over time, having to pay more and more of it anyway in interest payments to China and the private sector, uh, uh, people that have uh, bought government bonds and repaying the principal. And they talk about the government needing to pay down its debt over time, otherwise the interest burden will get bigger and bigger and compromise the ability of the government to maintain public services in the future. This is nonsense. Why would the government need to borrow its own currency from China? The government issues the currency. Instead, yes, the federal government issues the currency. Every time the government spends a dollar, it's a new dollar. This is true even when the government is issuing those new dollars in order to pay interest on the treasury bonds, which it has chosen to issue in the past, even though there was no obligation on it to do so. Um, in the US, there may be a legal obligation at the moment. There hasn't always been, and that could easily be eliminated in other countries. There is no such legal obligation. Government spending, of course, creates those public goods and services, those collective goods and services, which provide us with our social and economic infrastructure underlying our whole economy and employment and profitable businesses. When the government spends, it puts additional net financial assets into our private sector. In order to prevent this additional spending being inflationary, well, of course, some of those dollars have to be deleted again in the form of taxation. What's left in the system, we have gone into the habit down the decades of providing savers with the option of instead of holding cash, um, getting a bit of interest or a bit more interest by holding treasury bonds instead. That's, that's what treasury bonds are all about really. But obviously the government cannot run out of dollars. And obviously, if the government has net spent in the past and built up what we call a government debt, if it's a monetary sovereign, there is no insolvency risk. They're just dollars they've spent and haven't taxed yet. And if it is necessary at the moment because of a major economic crisis for the government to do even more of this, there is no limit to the ability of the government to do so. I said it's common to uh, divide up the monetary system into, into three groups, the government and the rest of the world and the private sector. And we've got US sectoral balances uh, here uh, over the last, what, 60 years? And you can see under normal circumstances, the private sector is in surplus. That means the private sector over time adds to its net saving, it's net financial assets, it saves up in US dollars. Uh, in the early part of the period, the relationship between the US and the rest of the world on the balance of payments was uh, sometimes in credit, sometimes in, in debit. As we can see here, and particularly after, you know, after 2000, after the GSC anyway, um, the rest of the world ran large financial surpluses on the, on the US monetary system. This was basically America's, well, technically current account deficit or trade deficit with the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world wanted to acquire US dollars. So the blue, that's the private sector needing to acquire US dollars to have healthy balance sheets. The green, that's the rest of the world acquiring additional US dollars. Well, where could they get these US dollars from? only one place, which is the US government. And that's why the US government balance across this period has almost entirely been in deficit because the government's deficit is everybody else's surplus. 
we notice that the only significant sequence of government budget surpluses here was under Bill Clinton at the end of the 1990s and just into the 2000s. And we notice at that time what the counterpart of that was, the private sector going into deficit and then going heavily into deficit. And even after um, the post-2000 um, um, the, the recession and uh, the shock to the economy um, and to US society generally from what happened in 2001, when the uh, government budget went back into deficit again, we can see it wasn't big enough given the um, demand for dollars from the um, rest of the world to support the US economy without the private sector being encouraged by, yes, by um, a big cut in interest rates, but also continuing financial deregulation, a property bubble to go further into debt. We know the contribution that that made to the global financial crisis, after which, of course, the private sector went temporarily anyway, heavily into surplus. And uh, that was facilitated by the government going heavily into deficit. In Australia, well, most countries are a bit like the US. At least most countries that don't have uh, large and persistent trade surpluses are a bit like the US. Um, private sector surpluses, government deficits nearly the whole time. That's what you expect. In Australia, we have a different story. In, the Australia, in Australia, at least up until the last year, um, yeah, the foreign sector has been running a surplus uh, with us. Um, that would not have been a major issue for our financial stability if the government deficit had been large enough so that the private sector could also have been running a surplus. But very unusually, the Australian private sector, particularly between 1996 and 2008, was persistently and heavily in deficit. In other words, we supported our economy, allowing the government to much of the time over that decade run budget surpluses. We supported our economy while the government was vacuum cleaning dollars out of the system by, again, deregulating our private sector and basically having a, a property bubble and household debt more than trebling as a share of our gross domestic product so that we have virtually the world's record level of private sector debt. So our government having a low level of national debt compared to other countries. Our government having pursued an austere approach to economic management and doing all the things that someone like Warren McKibben would have approved of during those years when John Howard's government was running surpluses and even subsequently when Labour and coalition governments were trying to get back to a surplus uh, once again it's just helped to drive our private sector into debt. It's created a more fragile system. Private sector debt is bad debt. If you're a monetary sovereign, there is nothing inherently bad about government debt. The government should run whatever fiscal deficit is necessary to support the economy. And if you want to call it a government debt, the net money supply, the government's net debt over time should be whatever it has needed to become. It's not in itself a problem. And if you don't run persistent trade surpluses, we can go a little bit further. We can say not only is a government deficit not unsustainable, it's a government surplus that's unsustainable because it drives the private sector into debt. Or maybe it even creates the circumstances which might lead to a recession or a 2008 style financial crisis. It certainly made Australia more vulnerable to the economic impact of a crisis like the one we're going through at the moment, all that household debt. So when we get to the end of the story, what have we got to say? Don't set any specific target for the government budget balance. In most countries, most of the time, the government will run a fiscal deficit 
and that's as it needs to be. If the private sector needs to be in surplus, the government has to be in deficit to allow that to happen in countries that don't run big trade surpluses. You should be aiming to balance the economy, not the budget. When we talk about balancing the economy, normally that means running whatever fiscal deficit you need to run in order to bring about non-inflationary full employment. We haven't been at full employment in countries like Australia for nearly half a century. We need to get back there. You should never ask a monetary sovereign government how you'll pay for something. Journalists do this all the time. For every policy proposal that a government minister or an opposition politician might put forward, it's always, how will you pay for it? Nobody should ask that ever again after the current crisis, never. Because we should all have learned how the monetary system works. You need to ask, how will it be resourced? At the moment, the issue is not, how will we pay for the government to support people's incomes if people lose their jobs? At the moment, it's about, how will the government ensure that there are the necessary real goods and services available that people will need to buy with the income they're receiving? And as I said earlier on, I think a federal job guarantee would have allowed our economic system to deal with the current crisis much better, much more smoothly if there had been one in place. And we should be moving towards introducing one, even in the middle of a crisis. It would be a superior automatic stabiliser. During a downturn, people will automatically go into the job guarantee programme. It will support their incomes. It will make the downturn less severe. Uh, if the economy should recover, and uh, um, in order to avoid inflationary uh, consequences as a result of demand outstripping supply, it's necessary for the government budget to move back towards a smaller deficit or potentially even a period of surplus. Then that happens automatically to an extent through the tax system, um, but it would happen much more um, efficiently if there was a federal job guarantee in place because spending on the job guarantee would automatically fall as the economy recovered, as people found uh, better paid jobs back in the private sector or the conventional public sector. Um, it's a superior automatic stabiliser. Um, we are overdue when a federal job guarantee should be rolled out in countries like Australia and the US. I hope it happens soon. There is a movie that I hope will come out in the next few months featuring uh, the work of uh, Stephanie Kelton and a variety of other modern monetary theorists called Finding the Money. Look it up on the internet, maybe even contribute towards uh, helping to fund some of the expenses associated with it if you've got a few spare dollars. Stephanie was in Adelaide, she was our guest um, in January. And on January the 14th, she delivered the Harcourt lecture named in honor of uh, Jeffrey Harcourt, who you can see sitting in the front row there, watching her deliver it. I'm somewhere off to the right hand side there. It was great having her here uh, at the time. We had no idea what was coming around the corner, but we knew then, as we know now, that it is essential if we are going to improve the quality of people's lives in many countries, and meet challenges like not just the current crisis, but climate change in the future more effectively, that we get the monetary system and the role of the government budget in the economy right. And that's why I very strongly recommend her book, The Deficit Myth. Thanks very much. We'll leave it at that.